I read a great quote recently, and I'm going to read it to you now. Success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is a natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals. And I think that quote stuck with me when I read it because at the time I was thinking about fueling and hydrating for endurance performance. And I think a lot of athletes, and back in the day I include myself in this, think about fueling and hydrating as being a bit of a mysterious black art. You know, it goes right some days, but it doesn't go right on other days. And why is that? Well, I think, you know, with the experience that I've built up now and the, the depth of experience we've got in the Precision Hydration team, we've come up with a more systematic approach to helping athletes get their fueling and hydrating right most, if not all of the time. And we refer to it as something called the three levers. And we call it the three levers because of the three fundamental costs of doing an endurance event. You've got calories that are burned, mainly in the form of carbohydrate. You've got fluids that you lose through sweating, and you've got sodium and salt that you lose through your sweat as well. And if you can get the right amount, or roughly the right amount of those things, carbohydrates, fluids, and salts, back into your body while you're exercising, a lot of the other details take care of themselves. Now, I'm not going to pretend that sports nutrition can be wrapped up into something that simple, but these fundamentals underpin everything that goes on when you're doing a hard endurance event. And if you get those right, you're on the right path to success. So that's what we're going to explore now. Now, everything that follows is talking about optimizing performance when you're going very, very hard. And that's an important point because when I'm talking about different durations of activity here, we're not talking about going out for an easy spin on the bike or an easy jog. This is about optimizing performance and what levels of intake should be required when you're pushing very hard. But with that in mind, we'll jump in with the first one, which is carbohydrates and talk about that. Now, when you're doing activities of less than about an hour in duration, as long as you're starting well fueled, carbohydrate intake is probably not important at all to maintaining your performance. Studies have shown that, practical experience shows that, that really within an hour you've got enough what we call endogenous carbohydrates stored in the body to fuel that activity. When you move up to two to three hours of activity, there is a benefit to taking in some carbs. And as a starting reference point, as a rule of thumb, I usually recommend about 30 grams an hour. Now that's based on a combination of what I've read and what's in the peer reviewed science and also from personal experience. So 30 grams an hour for, for activities of, of two to three hours. When you get to kind of three, four hours, it's more like 60 grams an hour because that endogenous carbohydrate that's stored in your body is starting to get burnt through and you're going to need to top it up at a much more rapid level. Um, when you get beyond the sort of four or five hour mark, a lot of athletes, especially those at the sharp end of races who are working very hard and burning a lot of fuel, are up at the 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour, which is quite a bit, but that seems to be optimum for sustaining performance. Now, Applying those numbers to you as an individual, there is a bit of flex because a very big athlete who's working really, really hard is probably going to take those numbers and add a little bit or work up to the higher range within those three numbers. 30 grams for one to two hours, 60 to two to three, and 90 for beyond that. Now, if you're a small athlete and you're not working so hard, then you're going to be on the lower side of those. So they might be the ceiling of where you get to in your experimentation. But I would use those numbers as a baseline starting point, try them out, and then this is where trial and error comes in. You've got to re do repeated training sessions at a high intensity, varying the amount of carbohydrate that you're taking and noting down how you feel, how your stomach responds to that and how your performance goes, because that is where you're going to learn how to dial this in for your individual case. Now when it comes to fluid intake, the numbers involved are a lot more volatile than they are with carbs. And that's because differences in environmental conditions, um, in terms of temperature and humidity especially, can have a profound effect on how much sweating you're doing, how much fluid you're losing and therefore how much you need to take in. But to give a basis to start working on, to give you some figures for, for your own trial and error experiments, I would say anything below an hour of activity, like with carbs, the need to take fluids in is pretty limited. It doesn't mean you should deny yourself fluids if you feel thirsty and if you can have some available then that's great and, and try drinking if you feel like you need to but don't worry too much. If you start an activity lasting an hour well hydrated it's going to take a lot of sweating for you to become significantly dehydrated enough for that to affect your performance by the end. 
When we get into the two to three hour zone though, the story changes and you have got to be drinking, especially if it's hot and humid and you're losing a lot of sweat to maintain your performance at an optimal level. Now for this sort of duration of activity, rather than setting targets or having a firm strategy about how much to drink, I often find it's a good idea to get athletes to learn to listen to their bodies and, and respond to the dictates of thirst. So you basically drink instinctively if you've got a bit of experience and that can be good enough for this duration. If you're a novice athlete, you might want to start with a bit more of a structure and I would advise people to look at something in the region of four, 500 milliliters or around 16 ounces an hour as a good benchmark but still try and individualize that and, and as you get more experience rely on your intuition to get that dialed in and get it right. When you go beyond three, four hours though it's a different story and having a flexible hydration plan based on what you think you're going to lose is quite important because I think the, the chances of getting dehydrated and your performance suffering later on are increased quite a bit especially if it's hot. Basically, if you drink to thirst early on in a very long event, for a lot of athletes that results in quite a high level of dehydration being accrued before you really start to, to feel thirsty enough to drink a significant amount and by that time performance can start to tail off. So I always try to get athletes, and I do when I'm performing myself in, in long events, try to have an outline plan of what I'm going to drink early on and then maybe switch to a drinking to thirst approach later once I know that I've not got too dehydrated. Now, the amounts that you're going to play around with to do this can be wildly variable but something if you're a low sweater something in the region of 500 to 500 mils to 16 ounces an hour might be good at the lower end at the higher end it could be as much as double that uh, one liter 32 ounces per hour it really depends on the mode of activity how much you're sweating how much your gut can tolerate and all sorts of factors so think about starting some trial and error within that zone but then be very prepared to refine it and move that number based on what you find out the third lever is sodium because we lose that in our sweat, at some point we need to start to replace it in order to maintain blood volume and hydration status. Now, when we're doing an event that's less than an hour in duration, sodium is pretty much a non-event. It's good to maybe use a strong electrolyte drink with lots of sodium in it before that activity to boost your blood volume and make sure you're well hydrated. But assuming you are starting something of an hour in, in, in good shape, you're not going to benefit from taking a lot of sodium in during that activity. There simply isn't enough time to lose an amount that will be impactful to your performance. When we get out to two or three hours, there's a bit of a division starts to happen between those people who have low sweat and sodium losses who need very little supplementation of sodium through to those who have high losses who could benefit from taking in quite a bit. And to give you a handle on what that range might be, if you're someone who loses a small amount of salt in your sweat, you might get away with negligible to two or three hundred milligrams per hour. If you lose a lot, like me, you might benefit from taking 800 or 1,000 milligrams an hour. So that's the kind of range that we should be starting some experimentation in. When you get out beyond three, four, five hours of activity, especially in hot weather, the differences between people can be huge. So to use myself as an example as someone who's got very salty sweat and a high sweat rate, I found that in Ironman competition I would benefit from taking up to 1500 milligrams of sodium per hour on the bike in order to get maintain my hydration and get me off the bike in good shape. Other people can get through an Ironman or two or th on two or three hundred milligrams of sodium an hour if their losses are very, very low. So there's a broad range there, but identifying whether you're someone whose needs are kind of low, medium, high or very high is the aim. Now, if you've had a sweat test like the one we offer at Precision Hydration, you've, you'll have a good idea of what your sweat sodium losses are, and that's relatively straightforward to do. If you've not had a chance to have a sweat test, then estimating your sweat sodium loss is the next best place to start. And the way to tell if you're a salty sweater is to look at things like your caps, look at the helmet straps from your bike helmet, just look at your skin and clothing after hard workouts in the heat. Is there a residual lot of salt there that you can see? Does your sweat sting in your eyes? Do you feel a bit crappy after hot? events or or crave a lot of salt do you get a lot of muscle cramps all of those type of things are indicators that if they apply to you mean that you could be losing a little bit more salt in your sweat now we call this the three levers but there is a kind of fourth element that's very important as well and is worth acknowledging and that's pacing if you get your pacing wrong 
it kind of doesn't matter how good your carbohydrate, fluid or salt intake is, your performance can be seriously undermined. And that's because if you go out too hard, you'll burn a lot more calories because you'll be in an inefficient zone. You'll sweat a lot more, so you'll become dehydrated more easily and you'll lose a lot more salt. And all of that combined can really hamper your performance. It can also hamper your performance because you get less blood flow to the gut, so you can't absorb the things that you're eating and drinking and it all starts to go wrong. And I've, I've talked to a lot of athletes over the years who think they've got their hydration or nutrition wrong in a race, but when you look at their power files or when you look at their pacing structure, it's actually that that's undermined their performance. So if you want to really, really dial your, your nutrition, hydration strategy in and pull those three levers correctly, you've got to underpin it with excellent and conservative pacing as well. So there you have the three levers, carbohydrate intake, fluid intake, and sodium intake. And the important thing is with these three things, if you get them fundamentally about right, your body will thank you and your performances will follow. Now, what I've talked about today is all about estimating how much carbohydrate you might need, how much fluid you might need, and how much sodium you might need in different circumstances. And then most importantly, getting out there and doing some trial and error around those numbers to really figure out what works for you. If you do that, and if you do that consistently and apply those fundamentals time and time again, you will gradually nail this down and become a real expert at it. And that will unlock the way to a much, much better performance.